Hey, podcast listeners, Jim Tew coming to you on Honey Bee Obscura, where normally Kim and I talk about all things beekeeping, but Kim's away for a week, so we got our good friend from Beekeeping Today, our sister podcast, Jeff Ott, with us. Good morning, Jeff. Hey, Jim. How are you doing? You in good spirits and ready to fill some big shoes? Uh, and not only am I in good spirits, I've broken into the spirits. I am feeling really good. <laughs> just okay. just kidding. No, I'm, I'm feeling I real good. I understand. Yep. Quite a breakfast you've had then already. <laughs> plenty, just... plenty of coffee. <laughs> well, what we normally do, Jeff, I think you know the drill since you're behind the scenes all the time. We, Kim and I talk about various issues in beekeeping, and one of the ones that we've been holding back for a while, but today is a good day, is that uh, beekeepers write us. They send us comments. They send us questions. Yeah. And we let those back up. So we've chosen three of those today. You want to talk about those with me? I sure do. I appreciate you inviting me in on the conversation. Okay. Well, let's look, let's look forward to it. You are listening to Honey Bee Obscura, brought to you by Growing Planet Media, the folks behind Beekeeping Today podcast. Each week on Honey Bee Obscura, host Kim Flodham and Jim Tu explore the complexities, the beauty, the fun, and the challenges of managing honeybees in today's world in an engaging and informative discussion meant for all beekeepers, long timers, and those just starting their journey with bees. So sit back and enjoy the next several minutes as Kim and Jim explore all things honeybees. One of the first ones that came in that was I found to be interesting is from Michael P. Let's just give the first letter of the last name. Michael? Hey, Michael. Thanks for writing us, but you wanted to know what's involved in going from deep frame operation, deep box operation, to a medium box operation. Does that make sense, beekeepers? Keeping bees in the deep high bodies, you want to move to keeping bees in the medium high bodies. How do you go about doing that? You ever done <laughs> such a thing, Jeff? Uh, not mid-season, I haven't. Uh, when I first moved here to Washington State, uh, I decided, well, it's a great opportunity to move everything to medium, uh, eight frame mediums. And uh, and I that's, I took that opportunity to start out new with it, all that equipment. But not in the middle of season. Uh, it sounds like that'd be a bit of a challenge. Uh, have you done that, Jim? Well, I, I do have some comments, but before I make those, Why? Jeff, why did you look at mediums instead of deeps? Well, um, partly because of the weight uh, was the, the weight of handling the full ten box, uh, ten frame box of, of of super in the middle of the season was uh, was a challenge. And yeah. after after a high, you know, one or two colonies, maybe not so bad. But if you're doing ten or twenty or thirty, that <laughs> the older you get, yeah. it seems like the tougher that gets. It get yeah, each understand. box gets heavier. So uh, when I restarted, I decided. Well, I I moved to eight frame and decided. Well, if I'm going to do eight frame, might as well try all mediums because that seems to be, um, you know, it seemed to be a, a, a management technique I hadn't tried before. So I wanted to give it a try. You're almost exactly in tune with the short comment that Michael made was that he's, he said, and I want to quote him, that it would give him some flexibility and be a wee bit lighter. Yeah. So it, it looks like the universal reason is the weight of the equipment. There is a quirk, though. When you were talking, I was, you know, being an old guy, memories kind of come and go as they want. <laughs> I have no control over it all the time. But one of the members that popped back is that a medium depth super is pretty much the size of a cavity that some of the researchers have been able to show in the field that bees naturally select when given the choice. Mm -hmm. So it's intriguing that this medium depth super is about the size of the cavity that bees choose in the wild. I'm not saying that's a reason to or not to. But that is an interesting quirk. Is that a medium size eight frame or medium fry? Medium size, uh, yeah. Not not, I mean, not not medium fries. Medium hey, size. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, see where I my have, mind is. You sound like I'm talking to Kim. He is sold <laughs> on eight frame equipment, man. He is sold on eight frame equipment. But when I talk beehives, I generally talk ten frame. Ten frame. 
Uh, you ask if I had had the experience. It's ironic. The first day, Jeff, the very first day that I ever walked into a beekeeping class <laughs> at Auburn University, the beekeeping professor had a table saw running. No guard. You don't need a guard. So no. the way. <laughs> and he had students ripping down deeps mm. to to mediums. Now I want I want you to know this was 1974. So it's not that no one cared about safety. It's just we hadn't gotten to the point yet that you shouldn't be doing that kind of thing. So one of the first things I saw, one of the very first things I saw was bee equipment being modified from deeps to shallow, to mm -hmm. uh, mediums. And the professor's reasoning was that he had gotten too old and he just didn't want to handle those deeps anymore. So this comes up over and over again. That seems to be the reason, the only reason the weight of it. And I I just want to step right up, Jeff, and say that the weight is an issue, but it's a clumsy size box. Mm -hmm. Whether or not it's a medium or a deep, I have to reach over and with my fingertips on a ridiculously small handle, pick up, in the case of a, of a medium, 60 to 65 pounds, right. in the case of a deep, 80 to 85 pounds, I mean, that's a 20-pound difference. I'm in a clumsy position, though, with fingertips and a dead strain, and I can't tell you that 20 pounds makes or breaks the deal so much as just being in a clumsy position. I think it all comes down to repetitive weight, you know, cumulative weight. So one, yeah. one or two boxes, it's not, you know, okay, it's the same. You know, it, it feels pretty much the same. It's awkward. It's a strain, but if you're after ten or twenty boxes, it adds up. So, um, yeah. So I, I think I think weight's an issue. Yep. If you have more than two hives, I'm not opposed to it. Sounds like I'm arguing. I have said time and time and time and time again. I keep my bees in ten frame deeps because I inherited my remnants of my father's bee supply operation, and I've got enough deep high bodies to last me the next two lifetimes. That is why I use them so frequently. But if you're going to do this, Michael, there is no convenient time to start it. You said you started it the first of the season, and I'm assuming you acted like you were just starting with new beehives. Yeah, otherwise, you can cut the boxes down. You can't cut the frames down. So deciding to go to mediums from deeps, that's, you're basically starting over. Sell, sell off the deeps and just start over. What would you say? You could do it as a management exercise and experiment and try to, how do you get the, the bees to move out of the, the deep? For a deep box and move up into a brood box that's now a medium. Uh, you could experiment with different types of, uh, of enticing them up into the medium box, and that'd be fine. But I think for if you're if you had a large scale uh, operation, you wanting to do that, I would just uh, as your colonies turn over at the end of the season, and as you catch swarms, you just do a gradual move to medium boxes, and in that way, it saves yep. you a lot of time and, and yep. hassle. So you be, yeah, it's going to be a transition. There'll be a year yep. or two into it. You're still going to be some percentage, both. Let me tell you, you know, I, I like it when, when people have this odd comment. I see it all the time now in the news clips. I'm a woodworker. Don't try this at home. You know, or I'm a nutritionist. <laughs> These are five things you should eat. I'm a car mechanic. Always do this to whatever. Well, I'm a woodworker, and I want to tell you when you it is dangerous to start sawing those boxes down. So, if you've heard us say anything here today that implies that you ought to take the guard off a table saw and set that fence up and rip those boxes down to mediums, I want you to know you've got to have carbide tip blades. Yep, you're going to hit nails. They're going to go flying across the shop. You've got to have on face protection. If you use a, a you know a hand power saw, circular saw, same thing. Yep. It's going to grab, bind. I, I just, uh, I've done it. I can't recommend that you do it. It's just not worth it. Use other equipment. I agree. And in fact, I would suggest if you're going to move to all medium equipment, instead of cutting down your deeps, sell them and buy new medium equipment from a supplier, such as our good sponsor, Better Be. Yep. Better Be is pleased to sponsor today's episode of Honey Bee Obscura Podcast. For over 40 years, Better Bee has supplied beekeepers across the country with the tools, equipment, and knowledge needed to succeed. 
Because many Better Bee employees are beekeepers themselves, they understand your needs and challenges and are better prepared to answer your beekeeping questions. From their colorful catalog to their support of beekeeper educational activities, including this podcast, Better Bee truly lives up to their tagline of beekeepers serving beekeepers. See for yourself at betterbee.com. Well, I think we got that worked out as much as we can, Jeff. Uh, good, good reasons probably wait for using mediums. And if you got them already, gradually phase them out, bite the bullet. You and your bees can evolve together. As you get older, your <laughs> beehives get smaller. There you go. Let's do another one. All right, sounds good. I, I enjoyed that, but let's just let's just keep the enjoyment going. I, I, this one <laughs> threw me for a loop. I actually have a have mentioned it in one of my upcoming beekeeping articles, but I want to do it again. Jacob asks, "What is your favorite or your most frequently used tool that is not really meant to be a beekeeping tool?" Does he mean out in the yard or just? Yeah, I would think you anywhere you want it to be. What do you use in your bee operation that you didn't buy from a bee supply catalog? Is that the way I could word his question? I would imagine so. Um, now you go first. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It doesn't have a little. It doesn't have a bee imprinted on the side of it. Um, you know, I don't. I can't think of anything that, uh, offhand right now that I have. Other than looking forward to this season, I am going to try uh, a, a battery-powered leaf blower to blow out bees from my honey supers. Oh, I've always yeah. Been, yeah, yeah. I've always been a fume board, uh, using fume boards and a bee brush on, on occasion. And, you know, the around here, I just there's just not enough sunshine or heat in the air to be real effective on the fume board like I had in Colorado and Ohio. So I'm looking forward to trying to be a leaf blower this year. I use those too. You know, the, I don't do, do do our listeners know where you are that you're in the Pacific Northwest? <laughs> well, I'm afraid if they've listened to Beekeeping Today podcast enough, they've heard me complain plenty of times. <laughs> so when you say here, you and I are a long way apart yeah. right now. I use leaf blowers too. And I a sad story, uh, a bee supply company since the mid-60s, manufactured a dedicated bee blower, five-horsepower gasoline-driven engine. And in my lifetime, I have been had a personal relationship with five different models of that machine. Mm -hmm. And I noticed about a year ago that that blower was now in the discontinued section hmm. and was marked down from the regular $800 price to $600, and it's going away. And it went away very quietly. There was no fanfare. And the primary thing that happened that made that thing become irrelevant was commercially available leaf blowers came everywhere, battery-powered, yeah. gasoline-powered. They do the same job. They're lighter. Everything about them worked out better. And especially, I mean, just dealing with a gas and a, a, a gas powered leaf blower is just a, a pain and a little, you know, don't need a whole lot of power on that. Nope. You know, I'm, it's so easy to get off the subject on these things because I've, I've used them a lot. First of all, these things are beacons, uppercase, bolded, underlined. These leaf blowers are beacons for starting robin. Mm. So think about it. Your honey flows over. You want to take off your surplus honey. Nothing's out in the field. Everything's kept over. So let's go out and aerate the whole apiary for all these unemployed foragers. And they will go ballistic when you get that whole place smelling like honey in the yeah. air. But the thing is happening, and usually you're, you're attacking all the colonies. So there's, it seems to cause wild confusion. It's Typically pretty busy when you're But when you say honey. you don't need a lot of air, you don't, because if you have really strong air, I mean, you'll, you'll actually blow the bee's abdomen off. The, the head will be, head and thorax will be in the cell eating honey, and their abdomens are sticking out, and you hit them with so much air, it'll rip off their abdomens, and then that bee's having a very bad day. That would not be 
That would be. That would not be. That would not be good. When I read that question, I'm ashamed to tell you that the first thing I thought of before I could get control of my own thought was that the, the tool I used the most that I did not buy at a bee supply company mm-hmm. was my cell phone. Oh, that's a good one. Because, I mean, I'd never go to a bee yard without it. Yeah. If I have a heart attack or a stroke, the last thing I want to be doing is trying to dial <laughs> 911 out there. So I, I have it all the time. And when I'm not having medical emergencies, <laughs> it's my friend for what's the latest update on Varroa control. And can I get a particular piece of equipment from our supplier by looking at the catalog online? Or photographs. But I thought, that's not really what Jacob meant. So not wanting to compete, not wanting to enter this this contest of who has the weirdest device, I use a heat gun a lot. Mm. Mine happens to just happens to be the Milwaukee brand. It, everybody manufactures one of these things. So why would I why would I want a heat gun? When I go out to a big colony that's really st- that's really jammed up tight. You haven't been going into it enough. Propolized solid. You get that thing off. You get it back to the honey house. I can hit that rabbit where the, the frame rests are. I can hit that with a heat gun and soften that propolis and wax and, and break that loose surprisingly quickly. Wow. I use a heat gun to clean up my extractor. When you got pieces of wax stuck to the extractor, Mm -hmm. on the Mm -hmm. floor, on your extracting knife, and the knife is already cooled down. I don't know, whatever. That heat gun is always there, ready to go. I think you could also use it with the sieve sieve for the out of the extractor, too, if you have one one of those stainless steel strainers. Yes. You know, I had not thought about that. You could uh, use it to soften that and melt the crystallized honey or to melt the wax cappings. Yeah. It's good Better idea. there. I sound like I'm selling heat guns. I'm not, but I've never <laughs> seen a heat gun for sale. But I use them all the time. This is a quirk I came up with. This is a Gem 2 quirk that I don't know that, who anybody else has ever done this. But I carry a pocket knife. I've carried a pocket knife since I was a Cub Scout. Mm-hmm. And on occasion, when you get a new knife or your knife gets rusty and kind of seizes up in the hinge, if you put just a tiny clip of beeswax on the hinge mechanism of your pocket knife and then heat it with that heat gun, that Mm -hmm. beeswax goes all down, permeates that pocket knife hinge, that's a freebie, listeners. It makes that pocket knife work smooth as it could possibly ever work. I used to carry pocket knives all all the time, too, until TSH start taking them away. Oh, uh, isn't that the truth? <laughs> Don't ever try to carry a pocket knife into a national museum. There's no you sense of humor. World class criminal. <laughs> <laughs> and mine's just a, a two and a half, three blade stock. Why don't we get off on this? Uh, just a common pocket knife. And I, I, I've been kept out of professional football games <laughs> because I had a two, I had a, I had a two and a half inch pocket knife. All yeah. right, enough about that. And the hinge mechanism on it. I thought the last thing we'd do just very briefly because it was so interesting. Yeah. Richard S. wrote me on my webpage that when he tries to determine who the robbers are from the bee colonies that's attacking his yard, apparently he stands quietly, lets the robbers come for his veil. Get ready now. Mm -hmm. And while they're attacking him, he tosses flour, F-L-O-U-R, flour, Mm-hmm. into the air. It gets on the bees. And then after he does that for a few seconds, a few minutes, I don't know how much flour you think it'd take, Jeff. Oh, geez. I don't know. Till you got enough. Then you monitor where those flower laden bees go back, which hive they're returning to. Have you ever heard of such a thing? Pause. Long pause. <laughs> yeah. No, um, not, uh, not, not, no, you know, I can, uh, two, I have two responses. One, my first and immediate response, and, and forgive me, Richard, is I, I can't imagine what his neighbors are thinking when he's out there in a bee yard with dozens of angry bees around his veil and he's pitching. <laughs> <laughs> fingerfuls of flour in the air and oh, poor neighbors it's always the neighbors yeah <laughs> uh, just uh yeah so 
so be, besides that, you know, the only other time I've seen something like that actually used, personally seen that used, um, years ago, I was down uh, in Mexico visiting uh, uh, Roger Hoopengardner and Chip Taylor at their lab in Mexico. And uh, Roger Hoopengardner was running an experiment and he was dusting the, the foragers as they left the hive. And returning, so he was, I'm not kidding, for the life of me, I can't remember the purpose of the experiment, but that was the first time I remember seeing the yep. bees with orange dust on them, orange chalk yeah. powder or something. And he was able to track and monitor them where they were going. Um, so, I, yeah, so it's a, it's, it's a proven, it's a proven method of tracking bees is to dust yeah. them with a the powder. And, and, yep. In Richard's defense, I, I've also heard of old, old time beekeepers who use flour to mark bees on a blossom, and then they would chase them back over time and find the bee nest, use them to line bees. So, well, entertain your neighbor, stand in the backyard <laughs> and throw flour in the air on yourself and on the bees, but it, I think it probably would work. I don't see why it wouldn't work. I, I just, it's, it's, the visual is, is entertaining. Yeah. Jeff, this is enough. We've just gone on and on. I enjoy talking with you, and we yeah, had some interesting comments from people that came in here. Write us if you want to talk with us more, and we'll capture these again and bring them back up later on. And I will even suggest and leave a, a if you don't want to write us, leave a leave a comment in the in the comments of this episode and start a discussion. What you know, hit on a couple good topics. What is your most frequently used non hive beehive tool that you use? Yep. As always, thank you for listening. Please. Please come back. We'll be here every Thursday morning talking about bees. Hey, thanks for inviting me, Jim. I enjoyed yeah. enjoyed this time. You did a great job filling in for a great man. Yep. All right. I'll tell you bye.